everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Anthony Brinkley, and he is talking about his book, You Can't Run Away from You, A Young Man's Journey to Himself. So, wow, I was reading your bio, and um, I'm incredibly impressed, so I have to read a couple of highlights from it. So, Anthony um, is the founder of his consulting company, OnTheBrinkConsulting.com, where he does a lot of leadership um, coaching. Um, and in addition to that, he was the Commander Chief Master Sergeant for the 11th, 11th um, Wing of the Joint Base Andrews in Maryland. So impressive. So I wanted to focus the interview on your experiences, not only as an African-American man um, growing up in the US, but then also about leadership. Um, and I wanted to start off with um, Lloyd Austin, who is our new Secretary of Defense, and which is, um, I, I think he may be the first African-American man in that position. And, I, and given your position, I just want to get a sense how that felt for you when you saw Lloyd Austin being um, you know, in that position. And of course, there's President Obama, but given your military experience, what was your reaction? Um, you know, my, my reaction is um, it was that I think he's a highly qualified individual. I think he's representative of um, the best that we have. And when you're talking about the armed forces, in which I served for 28 years, you want people in those key leadership positions that have the right ability, sensibilities, and um, focus, because you're talking about people's lives, but even more uh, specific to me, which, which impacted me almost as much, if not more, is a man named C.Q. Brown. C.Q. Brown is a four-star general. C.Q. Brown and I served together. We ran an installation in Korea. Mm. Um, that part of the world is very, very important to me. And C.Q. Brown is the first African-American in American history to run a branch of the military. He's, mm. he's, a, he's a chief of staff for the Air Force, currently serving as a four-star general, in which General uh, Austin retired as a four-star. So as, as I am uh, confident, General Austin will do a good job. I think people like him, and I'd like to mention one more person. Her name is Joanne Bass. She is uh, Korean-American. She is the first woman in the history of the United States of America to be the top enlisted person in any branch of the military. She's the first woman to be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. In the 70, over almost 80 year history, of the Air Force has never been a woman. In the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard, and now Space Force, she is the first woman. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about qualifications, and people who have served their time and bring the right uh, temperament and, and, and flexibility and, and diversity, Joanne Bass is an amazing woman, not just from Asian Americans, but for Americans and, 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 and people at large. Mm. I, um, when it's odd, I'm sorry, I have to turn on the light here. When you had said that, um, I got chills. I'm not even sure. I literally had chills that ran through my spine when you said those two <laughs> names. Um, what do what was your relationship to them? And, and um, what's your felt expression when you felt sense about them when you connect with um, these two incredible leaders that are just in the forefront? So General Brown and I, as I stated earlier, we, were, we, we ran Kunsan Air Base in Kunsan, Korea from 2007, 2008. If, if there was a war in Korea, our base um, would be the, the eighth fighter wing would be the first one to go to North Korea and execute our mission. Wow. General Brown, as a man of color, he was a colonel at the time. I was a chief mass sergeant at the time. And we were in charge of 3,000 people and a whole bunch, and, you know, basically mm -hmm. a billion dollars worth of assets that supported the flying mission. So I've known him. I served with him in it because people don't realize this that right now, Korea is still considered a combat zone. It's just a ceasefire. The Korean War is from night, the active war was from 1950 to 1953. And then a ceasefire was um, proffered. But right now, on the 38th parallel, where, where the, the dividing line between North and South, there's like a million troops on that border. Mm -hmm. So we, we pray wow. that nothing happens over there. And people, don't, why is it so important over there? One fourth of the world's economy is, uh, is, 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 is taking place in that area. So if something happened, the whole world's economy would be destabilized. 
So General Brown is a very good friend of mine, but more than that, he's he's a trusted, he's a true American. Joe Bass, um, I worked with her. I saw her come up in the Air Force. And, and for, so for little girls, for, for people of Asian descent, um, she has broken, she has shattered. She's in charge of 700,000 people. And I will tell you on a personal note, although she's highly qualified and she's doing dynamic things, um, she's she's had her challenges, and not because she's not she has qualifications, but some of the vitriol that she's had to experience in that position, some of the things that people have said since she's assumed that position last year, and she's had to experience from a safety standpoint, from being exposed to negativity, has been immense. She won't talk about it because she's a great American and she's a professional. But I'm just saying, when you're first, um, it can be hard. But she's equipped, mm -hmm. she's qualified, she's dedicated, and she is the right one for the job. And I feel, I call, I consider an honor to be her friend and a supporter. Mm -hmm. So when you think about what it takes to be the first black man or the first woman and first Asian American to serve those positions, um, and your position as well. I mean, when the recent reports on in um, the military are not so great. I mean, there there's a lot of prejudice um, against um, African Americans there, um, and I assume people of color generally. And it's very hard. You know, there's this whole issue about what how you can, how women can wear their hair. Um, there's now a whole group of women who have been have been you know had complaints against their seniors and, and, and sexual assaults and such. And there's just all this stuff happening um, in the military that has come now to the surface. What does it take to be to get to those levels? Um, you mentioned things like flexibility, you know, all those kinds of things. But what does it really take? And maybe it, it, sharing, um, and you'd mentioned that even with Joanne Bass at that, you know, there was a lot of ritual, I assume a lot of, you know, not positive comments coming her way. So how do you, how do you keep it together during those times? Well, using Chief Bass, for an example, even though she's had her challenges, the overwhelming majority of her engagements and, and her support is immensely positive. Um, so, so, you know, I don't want to, you know, put put my thumb on the scale and act like it's it's been you know a bad experience it's been an amazing experience and when you talk about things like hair and different things like that the air force actually changed the policy on how women can do their hair because when you you put a guy like me for example in that position i buzz my stuff around the edges and say i keep it moving so there are just certain things perspective wise that i might not be aware of that could that, that could seem simple to me but it can have a huge impact so what i would suggest to you and a short answer is that the same thing it takes for other people, you have to want, you have to be qualified. You have to have the right certifications and, and you have to have the right um, background and, and past performance and, and things like that, that have established you as, a, as an expert or someone who's proficient in what you're doing. Um, beyond that, you know, America, uh, you know, to paraphrase, we said, in our four founding father said that we endeavor to form a more perfect union meaning that periodically we have to evaluate where we are and look at with an objective eye, with a discerning eye, with an honest eye and a critical eye, what are the things that we can do better? So although some of the things you said, you know, we are dealing with their factors, um, that's why some of the changes that they make, you know, elections have consequences regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. And then people look at things that they stood for and ran on or espoused, and then they get in there and they try to engage them. So, it, it really what it takes for people of color is the same thing it takes for everyone else. Um, it, it, but it may take a little more perseverance sometime. It may take a little bit more uh, dedication. You have to maybe dust yourself off a couple more times. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you're qualified, my brother used to put it this way. He said, persistence will always overcome resistance. And mm -hmm. when I, I spent years in the Philippines and Korea and different parts of the world and I saw people who didn't have as much as I did physically, but man, their spirit, their ingenuity, and their ability to give and extend themselves showed me that maybe the stuff I had wasn't that valuable. So it's those intrinsic things that I believe that make you different, that make you stand out and distinguish you when things get hard. 
And when you get to that place, you become that beacon to illuminate other people's path. Mm. So how about yourself? Like what, how, how did you give me an example of where your persistence and dedication helped you move past some of the resistance, whether you're younger or, you know, in the army, just tell me a little bit about your life story. So for me, um, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not, that's not a, that's not hyperbole. When I was five years old, my parents told me we weren't going. I wrote about this in my book. They said, I th- they said, you don't have to go to school. Then. I was like, great, because I didn't really like school as a kid. I was like, I was goofing off. So we went, we drove for about three hours. And we ended up at this children's hospital where I was dropped off. And for about six months, I was going through chemotherapy and all other types of treatment. And so from that point, I was dealing with separation anxiety. I was traumatized. A lot of people don't know this in America, but, for, but um, 50% of Americans experience trauma before the age of 14. Yeah. And then 75% of Americans experience trauma before the age of 24. Hmm. So when I joined the Air Force, um, I was angry. I, I didn't trust people. I had abandonment issues. And I would look, when people tried to get close to me, I repelled them because it took me back to a place where the people I thought had my back, um, they dropped me off. You know, obviously I had to be there because I was sick, but but my mind wasn't fully developed. Your brain's not fully developed till you're like 25 years old. Mm. So my mind couldn't comprehend what happened. So for me, um, and then when I was in the first, after I got out of um, that hospital, I was, I was coming home from school in the first grade and I saw a kid get killed in front of me. I saw oh him God. die right in front of me in the first grade. And then I was walking home from school another day in the first grade and had a gun pulled on me with my brother. Hmm. And then um, four of my classmates, we grew up on um, by the Atlantic Ocean in Connecticut, and they built a makeshift raft and four went out and two came back. So I was traumatized. I saw more at by the age of seven than many people see over their life. So for me, um, I, you know, people, they took the time. It, it was almost like I had almost given up on myself, but I think the creator sent people my way to speak life into me and, and to maybe change my perspective that maybe it might look like somebody might hurt you or give them a chance. Don't broad brush stroke, you know, paint everyone the same way. And um, when I, when I got out of my own way and I, and I was able to do the work, I tell people, you know, most of us have the answers inside of us when we have problems. It's like a puzzle. You have all the pieces to get it fixed, but sometimes you need somebody to help you put the pieces together. Mm-hmm. And I had a couple of mentors that helped me put my pieces together. So I went from being, um, I, I turned my pain into my passion. Now it's, time, now it's my purpose. Mm, beautiful. Okay. I want to actually, in the next segment, talk more about um, the supporters that came together to help you and specifically things that people who like yourself have probably gone through trauma. If 65% have gone through trauma by the age of 14, 75% by the age of 24, you said, is that right? 50% by the age of 14, 75% by the age of 24. Yeah. So that's a lot of people that have traumatized. So I want to actually in the next segment, talk a little bit about Um, what you did, um, your process and the supporters. Sure. Um, Thank you so much. We've been talking to Anthony um, Anthony Brinkley about his book, You Can't Run Away From You, A Young Man's Journey to Himself. Um, Thank you so much. I'm honored.